Thanks for joining the Dope Vision Experience Podcast. It's your boy, Frank Nitty. I'm back on the road again with my virtual tour. This time I got my boy, Jay Hub, the legend. You know, he's a stock guru, so I had to go and get him so I can get some of this information out to the people. He been rocking online, doing his Sunday classes and kind of showing the people how to do some work. I've been able to, I've been fortunate enough to jump on there a couple of times and kind of see some of that information he's been issuing out. He's been doing it for free, so I'm pretty sure he got a course coming to you guys um, at some point. Um, this information is going to be helpful for you and your family and for the generational, for the generations that are going to be coming up behind you. So, you know, take take heed to what he say. Um, he's a guru. He's been giving me some tips as well. Uh, I'm still an amateur at this, but, you know, now we have a little bit more time with the pandemic. I want to kind of get a little bit deeper and get my feet wet a little bit more with the stocks. And so who else I'm going to go to? I'm going to go to the guy who kind of been put me on the put me on game. And you got to have people like this on your team to kind of, to kind of be able to kind of give you, you know, tips and, you know, opportunities to do different things if everybody doing the same thing and everybody not eating eating right you know you got to have people in different avenues and kind of showing you different things and that's why i have a, I have a wide net of friends and homies and diverse industries and so you know here's the boy here's the homie jay legend what's up man oh what's good man what's good man, i like that intro man all right he said a real professional that thing you know what i'm saying <laughs> boy you know been doing a couple couple of months now, so I'm kind of easing into this thing real nice. And you know, you the homie, so you know we already be in the chat talking back and forth. So I already know you, you know, been peeping game on how you've been running these stock classes and stuff. And I really, you know, what I'm saying I appreciate you been issuing out the information. I haven't been able to jump on all of them. You know, I've been traveling, but most of the time, you know, Sundays I try to kick back and kind of I look forward to seeing you, you know, and issuing out the information. You know, because people like me, you know, I have never been into the stock market and things like that. And you kind of put me on game with the with the apps and stuff like that. But I just <clears throat> I just haven't had an opportunity to dive deeper into it, but now, you know, with the pandemic going on, I definitely want to kind of get more involved with it, you know, put some more money behind it so we can make some money because, you know what I'm saying, I know once, once upon a time you talked about, you know, putting some money together and who, 25000 we can all kind of band in together and, and pool our money together and we can make some big things happen. And so I'm trying to get to that level where you at, homie. So, you know, first off, you know, I know you've been kind of paying attention to some of the things that's going on, like with this NBA. How you feel about the NBA? Like, how do you feel about with them coming back and stuff like that? Uh man, I'm 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 in the middle, man. Either or, like, uh, if they didn't come back, I don't think. I mean, I think at this point, I personally would miss it. Uh, I don't know how much, you know, if we'll if we'll even get through the whole NBA season. Like, it's. You know, it's one of those things that one person tests positive, they got to put a pause on everything. So, you know, you know, I'm just I'm looking at it. It's it's good to see basketball sports back. I think NBA is probably one of the few sports that's set up to where they can they can control it, uh, especially kind of this late in the season uh, with the playoffs. But you know, this might be the last of sports we get for a minute. Uh, just just looking at looking at what what what's going on. So. You know, I'm, it's, I'm happy to see, you know, uh, for them to get back to doing their profession and what they love. Uh, but, you know, if, you know, if it felt, if, if, we, if we didn't have it, I wouldn't be upset. Uh, but, you know, since we, we do have it, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to watch. Yeah, I know I was on record back uh, a couple of months ago. And I talked about, you know, starting back, especially when, you know, the George Floyd situation happened. I was kind of like, well, we don't need basketball right now. And things are kind of like some somewhat kind of move forward. And you now they've kind of picked up the bubble and the bubble life. And it's kind of starting to become its own thing. I, I kind of like the camera angles better because they, you know, they got the sideline cameras. You don't really have people in the way. So you can kind of get different views and things like that. But, you know, like I said, everybody could be at risk, just like what, what Lou just did. He just went out to Magic City. He's like, hey, I'm finna go get it in. And then I'm gonna imagine if he didn't get caught and he just would have slipped back into the bubble. And right, right. Like I said, he tested positive and he could have probably been there for two, three days. And I'm telling how many people would have came in contact with and doing right. like thing at risk. Because you're right, right, right. like eight games they're gonna play and then they're gonna try to ease into the ease, ease into the playoff. But if you you get you get the virus tested in the first two weeks, that's like the basically your whole seating. You can go from third to at the playoffs just like that. Yeah, yeah. And what what are they gonna do? Like say like they in the middle of the playoffs. We in the we in the finals and LeBron or Kawhi or Giannis test positive uh game four. You know what I'm saying? Are they gonna are they gonna keep playing it out or are they gonna postpone it? Like what you gonna do? You you you're gonna suffer through it or you gonna go ahead and tell them go home for ten days. Like, you know, they're in a, like a 
it's one of those great area type things when it comes down to that live sports. You know, you try to create the create the bubble was a it was a good idea, but how can you sustain that bubble when you got people coming and going, you got people serving you food, right, people right, trying right. to just it just more or less on the players to more or less kind of, you know, adhere to the guidelines because it could possibly work if mm-hmm. they stick to it. But you just know, man, you got three months or four months inside of a bubble where you're just seeing the same people over and over. over. Them guys don't want to take risks because they got families, they got kids, and, you know, you got your side chick, you know, she might want to slip on, slip in the <laughs> something like that, you know what I mean? So, you know, yeah. these guys going to, you know, some somebody's going to slip up and it's and something's going to, you know, happen and it's going to shut the whole thing down, especially, like I said, in the finals, what you going to do? You can't sit Braun down. He got all, he getting all the views. Like, he go right, on. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, yeah. It, all it takes is one one of your superstars to get it. I think uh, Harden and Russell Westbrook had tested positive at one point. You know what I'm saying? So You got your MVPs testing positive. Like, imagine yeah. if that would have happened two weeks after. That was right before they got to the bubble. Imagine if they would have eased into the bubble, you know, and test positive. It could have just set the whole thing. I was kind of like... Yeah, yeah. yeah, they would have to shut everything down. That's kind of what, what baseball just went through. They, they started up week and a half into it and boom, they got to shut the whole thing down for, I think the Marlins had like 19 players test positive or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Like crazy. And you trying to, you know, shift players in and off the court. So I don't know how they got the court set up. You know, I kind of just see it from the TV, you know, they kind of play here and they play there. But when you start kind of getting these games up and going and somebody messed around test positive and he missed, he has to go and sit down for five, six games or, you know, that, that changed the whole dynamic of the playoff. All right, 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 right. Playoffs, so yeah, it's it's gonna be interesting to see it unfold, man. Um, I just hope everybody stay healthy and you know they can they can get through the rest of the season and through the playoffs and give us you know if it's gonna happen and you know hopefully it, it happens to the to the fullest and we could we can experience a little bit of sports before uh, what I feel like sports come about to shut down for a long time, uh, at least team sports. Yeah, yeah, you can still you can still have like. Uh, like golf or tennis, uh, something like that. Tennis, maybe even track and field. Uh, but it's, you know, it's going to have to be controlled for yeah. a while. It's going to be hard, especially with no with no vaccine and sight. You know, all these companies out here rushing, trying to get some, you know, phase two, phase three, government dropping money here, dropping money there. All these, you know, everybody trying to get these uh, approvals, trying to get this money so they can get these vaccines out. But it's all about the money, you know. Yeah. That's that's going to be the biggest issue, and uh, football. You know, they still trying to get football, and you know, our players opting now. They trying to, you know, keep trying to keep it going. Like we are gonna have the season, but you know, like I said, man, it's just gonna be tough to try to have. You know, you got, you know, eleven. You got fifty two, fifty two man roster plus. You got the head coaches, and you got the administrator. It's gonna be hard to try to, you know, move yeah, football. Football. I don't. I think football gonna be a wash if if they. Cause you can't put you can't can you put thirty teams in a bubble? You can't man. Where are you gonna house them? You talking about thirty times the fifty two, times the coaching staff, times the practice squad, times, you know, replacement players. You gotta have replacement. Yeah, you got replacement players. You got people that that just run the facilities that are there all the time that that cater to the players. Then you think about the food that they're gonna consume, and you gotta bring in. Chefs and man, it's it's gonna be crazy trying to get football inside a bubble. I get a whole island, man. You gotta take a whole island. You gotta <laughs> island, bro. You gotta go down to the Caymans or somewhere off of Jamaica, or somewhere down there, man. Take a whole yeah. island over and just ship everybody in for about three weeks before they do anything, test everybody, and then say, hey, let's do it. But and that's and that's before you get to the field. Yeah. Let's just say you get to the field. If you're not playing on turf, you're playing on grass. Maintenance. How many teams are gonna be able to play on that one field in a day? Like a soccer field, they're gonna tear it up. Yeah, so uh, you know it's gonna be it's gonna be difficult. It's gonna be challenging. Yeah, it's gonna be tough. And and then you got the thing with the whole situation. I know I was back at home and it kind of broke when the Washington Redskins they finally got forced to change their name. Where it wasn't necessarily. I don't think it was a. Uh, they were gonna do it on their own. It was all about how that money. Like again, that money flow. And it's like Nike said, "Hey, look, we're not supporting you anymore." Uh, FedEx say, "Look, we're not supporting you anymore." Then two days later, it's like, "All right, look, we're gonna go ahead and change his name." Right, right, right. It, it mean, at the end of the day, it is all about money. Uh, you know, I think with the momentum that was built behind the protests and the different movements with uh, a lot of Fortune 500 companies being vocal, uh, you know, it just came down to, uh, regards of whatever reason, the companies decided to, you know, 
shift in that direction, it was just the momentum. And it was, you know, you either get on board or kind of suffer the consequences. Um, and, you know, a lot of these changes should have happened a long time ago. Definitely. You know? uh, but it just shows, you know, we, you know, without the money, without the power, there's little we can do uh, on, the, on the side of making those types of large changes. You know, there's smaller battles we can, we can take on and, and win and we can build momentum, but we need the, the, the financial backing uh, behind our movements uh, to make those types of changes where we're, where we're changing, uh, you know, cultures of companies, where we're changing the way companies think uh, to be more inclusive of people of color. So uh, one way or the other, we're going to need the financial backing, whether it's to, you know, attach ourselves to other companies and, and allow them to push our message, or we build it ourselves enough power and enough influence to push our message, message or come together so that we can push our message. But um, that's, that's the key, man. It's, it's going to come down to, you know, do you have the finances? Do you have the power to actually get those things done? Most definitely. And I think the one of the biggest things about that is because a lot of these, comp a lot of these uh, organizations, they're not publicly traded. And so they're, they're private equity, so they can kind of move and do what they want. They don't really have to answer to anybody and kind of lead into that stock talk. You know, if they were publicly traded, you know, the people have a little say so in and we can, you know, we, our money can be put behind something like this. Say, hey, we're, we're going to, we're going to, you know, what you call it, dump the stock or we can just short pocket. And that would really significantly hurt their pockets where he can be forced. But, but since they're privately, since they're private, you know, owned or equity or however they do this money because when you see they get ready to sell it'd be this whole team of people and it don't necessarily be one 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 person buying it. it'd be like a All whole right. organization a whole team of people getting together and pooling their money together and buying these teams and and kind of going so on and so forth and they not never never public right, right right like the knicks or something like that if they was comfortable with publicly traded then we can have a little bit more push and say so and doing stuff like that and right so, right right yeah, so you know, and with you, you know, definitely into that stock market. You know, I want to get your get your tip and your information, kind of pull some out of you, and like, like what some of those big time, big moments. Like, do, is the market down right now, or is it up? Yeah, I just give just kick you off with that. Uh man, visually the market is up, right? So if you're looking at, uh, well, I say up from where it was two or three months ago. Uh, you know the you know overall prices are going up and a lot of that's driven by um expectations you know we expect um uh, a vaccine so you know like you were saying earlier uh, a lot of these companies are in phase whatever um, and they've got testing for vaccines right and so we hear that information and we'll assume are the the the, the, the economy is going to go back to where it was right so uh, that fuels a lot of the movement in the market right now, and that movement is in a positive direction. Uh, another thing that's kind of moving uh, the needle on that is the government dumping a lot of stimulus money into the economy. Uh, and so when you dump that money, you're giving people funds to spend. Um, you're giving companies uh, funds to spend, whether it's to keep employees, whether it's keep the doors open, whether it's keep operations going. And so it gives the uh, the overall look that we're operating as normal, right? Payrolls are still the same. Payrolls come in the same. Uh, companies, you know, whether they, you know, they don't have to close their doors just yet. You know, they take, take the money from federal government. And so that gets extended. The time uh, from, the, the moment in which they will have to start closing doors or have to kind of reduce workforce gets extended. And so from the outside looking in, if you're looking at the market, the way the market has been reacting to that is in a positive direction. I, you know, my overall kind of uh, standpoint on the market right now is that we're in a, a time where the market doesn't represent the economy, all right? So you have the market, then you have the economy. The market is going up because of the perception that things will get good, get better, 
right? Uh, but the economy is not that way, right? There's layoffs around the door. There's cutoffs for uh, additions in unemployment. Uh, you know, people who accepted the CARES Act, uh, in, a, in a couple months, they will no longer have to carry those employees that they agreed to carry uh, by accepting those funds. So they will get laid off or furloughed. So when you look at the economy, the economy doesn't resemble the market, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the, the market resembles what people anticipation or expecta expectations of the economy may be. But as of right now, uh, the market is up. Uh, but I don't, you know, just being in where I am as far as my profession and where I came from, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of uh, cuts on the project sides. I mean, we're talking 80 to 90 percent of our budget was being cut. So, wow. yeah, it's a uh, it's an interesting time um, when you when you compare the market and look at where it's going now versus where we are as an economy. Uh, so. I don't know so, if that answers your question, but. So are you more of a, your strategy right now going forward, are you more, um, you, you invest in short term or are you doing more long, long term investments? So I shifted uh, my train of thought. I'm, I'm doing more more long term now. Um, and I say long term, I mean, I'm, I'm buying more stocks. Um, buying some of those companies that really got distressed and whose prices were, were dumped during this uh this time with COVID and, and layoffs and cutbacks and, and things like that. So, um, you know, I've, I've shifted, you know, I used to do a lot of short-term investing. Um, I used to trade options, um, which were short-term options, which, which um, you know, we could talk about, mm -hmm. uh, but I used to trade them on the short-term. So now I've kind of shifted it over to long-term. So I buy more shares of companies, you know, as I get paid every, uh, two weeks, I'll take a portion of that and buy companies. Right? And so as I started buying companies, um, my thinking and doing my analysis and looking at the, uh, the fundamentals of the company, I'm expecting these, these companies to recover. So these aren't, uh, I'm not rolling in the dice on uh, penny companies or companies that haven't been around a while or companies that haven't proven themselves. These are companies that were either once blue chip or have a strong financial, uh, strong financial statements, uh, and but they've just been a victim of what's going on right now. And so, uh, purchasing those securities and those shares, and just kind of holding on to them and waiting for you know recovery. Mm -hmm. So, how do you go about as a trader? You know, you say long term. Are you, first of all, or when you say long term, is this like a six month deal, three month deal? Uh, year long, year and a half, like what is your exit strategy when it comes to that? And then two, like when you, how are you going about finding these bargain basement, um, you know, what do you call blue chips or bargain basement companies to, to, to kind of invest in? Because like as a trader for myself, I would probably go into the app, you know, I'll probably think about the companies that I know off the top of my head, like Facebook or Google, but you know, these companies are, have been around, they, they have success and you know, they're going to continue to be here, but they're, they're still trading at a high dollar, but how do you find those, you know, $10 or $12 or something under $50 type bargain type blue chip companies? How do you go about finding those things? Um, so I guess answer your first question, what do I consider long-term? Um, you know, I'm looking at more of the recovery of the stock versus a time frame. You know, typically if you say long-term, you're, you're talking at least a year that will get you over that, uh, you know, paying capital gains tax, right? So if you hold something for 365 days, you can kind of skate that, that, uh, capital gains tax. Uh, and so I guess I start out there with the year, um, but there's not really a time frame when I'm, when I'm purchasing these companies, you know, I'm, you know, I take money that I'm, that I would typically put in a savings account or store away, um, and then just buy stock and I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. Right. So it's a waiting game. Um, it's, you know, buying stock and investing in companies is just like uh, real estate, right? you you'll never lose in real estate. Um, if you don't have to still sell before you want to. And so if you purchase these stocks at distress levels at uh, really low discounted prices and you, you don't need the money, 
um, you just kind of let it sit there until it recovers, till you get um, either, you know, I'll look at it and kind of determine uh, what does a full recovery look like and can it come out of, into a full recovery, whether it's pre-COVID or pre-five years ago, uh, and if it took a dip for some other reason. So um, I kind of look at um, over the last five or 10 years, see what has happened. Uh, a lot of what has happened because of COVID. So I'll start there. I'll say, I'm gonna buy these shares and I want to at least get to the mark where it was uh, pre-COVID. So that that's kind of my thinking as far as purchasing it long-term. Now, I say that if I wake up the next morning and, and the levels are pre-COVID, I may sell. So uh, like I said, there's no, I don't have really have a, uh, a time frame when I say long term, uh, but I guess for me when I say long term, I'm buying shares versus uh, you know dealing in options, uh, and so yeah, I'll, I'll hold them until I get to um, you know the number that I that I want to get to. Um, yeah, like I see, I see. You know, I've been you know just dibbling, dabbling in it. I know I kind of when I first got in it, you know, I was just buy some stocks or random stocks and then all of a sudden it'll go up or I buy it in, in the morning then I go to work or do something and the next hour is, is down and I lose money. And so, you know, I when the, when COVID-19 hit, I basically said, all right, I had bought some Snapchat because I was like, all right, Snapchat is going, it's dirt cheap right now. I know it, it was a pretty good company. I know it struggled for a little bit and I just bought some and just let it set. And of course I didn't check it. I wasn't really on it because I don't, I was, like I said, I wasn't really you know, into the stocks like that, like heavy, not paying attention a lot. And I go and open it up one day and I'm like, whoa, whoa, like what happened? And so it goes from $6 and it's up to 20 something dollars. And I see, I see what you're saying, like holding on to it. And because, you know, I, I'm thinking about when you're saying trade, I'm thinking about you get in, get out, get in, get out, get in and get out. But when you, you know, you're holding it more long term, you can kind of see that, that your investment kind of grows a little bit. You know, yeah. and we'll take a step take a step back for people who probably have never been into the stock market. So, how do you go about? You know, what's the first steps? Like, what apps are you using? Like to get involved with brokers and things like that to kind of help somebody who doesn't really have a lot of capital to kind of get in on it. And then, like, trying to get some of these free apps to kind of get people up and going when it comes to you know dealing with stocks. Okay, yeah. So um, one of the ones that I that I uh, started out with. Um, that I recommend to a lot of people that are just starting is Robinhood. Uh, it's it, it started out mobile platform only, and so it's the the user interface is very simplistic. Even though they they moved to a desktop uh, version of it now, it's still simplistic and easy to, easy to follow because they they built on top of a mobile platform. Uh, and so I suggest for anybody that's starting out, use Robinhood. Um, they do commission-free uh, trades, so you can buy and sell without paying a commission that your larger and more well-known uh, brokerages uh, charge. Um, and I mean, it's, you know, literally it fits in the palm of your hand. You know, I can, if I wanna look up a certain company, um, I could put it on my watch list. Um, I can create watch lists. They'll help me track companies. Uh, I can buy and sell right in the palm of my hand. You know, it's it's very user friendly. Um, and so that's one I would recommend. And then for your more advanced or um, more technical traders, I would uh, suggest pairing that with TD Ameritrade because they do have a platform uh, that's built for analytics. Uh, and it's called Thinkorswim. So, uh, you know, I, I started out a Robinhood a lot. I still, you know, when I'm when I'm teaching people, I use Robinhood as a reference. But a lot of what I do now is on uh, TD Ameritrade, uh, simply for the fact that I just, you know, I kind of move everything over to there, uh, and then I can use my analytical platform uh, in conjunction with my uh, TD Ameritrade account. Uh, so yeah, that's you know, I would definitely suggest Robinhood. Uh, and again, for people who don't know. Robinhood is a brokerage. Brokerages, brokerages are just like banks. Um, in fact, they are banks, but they will they allow you to purchase securities, which are stocks and um, uh, ETFs and things like that. So um, I tell people, if you got a savings account, you're not really collecting a lot of money in interest. You might as well put that money in a brokerage account. You don't have to buy anything or, or 
buying a stock right now, but a brokerage account allows you to do it whenever you want to. So uh, I tell people all the time, move your money from your savings account to a brokerage account and just save it in there. Um, and then when you find something you like, uh, see a company you like, you want to buy or purchase or invest in, you know, start to buy small shares here and there. Uh, so that's kind of what I would suggest, you know, to get started as far as brokerages are concerned. Um, but yeah. Where do you find this information? Like when, you know, saying you're saying you find putting things on your watch list, like for someone like me, mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of time to go out and like search this information out. I kind of go with the big names. So how are you finding these little, these little uh, diamonds in the rough type? Where's the information? Where are you grabbing that information from? Are they coming from apps or are you coming from like TV? Like where are you grabbing the information from? You know, I, I tell people to start out at your house, right? Look at everything that you use. Right? I, most of us have iPhones. So you got an Apple. Now within that iPhone, You've got several other parts, right? You've got Qualcomm. Um, you've got whoever makes the the screens, LG, or the, or Apple may make their own screens. But you're looking at Samsung. You got Samsung. If you got an Android, uh, LG may may make the screen. Uh, who makes the cameras? You know, does Apple make the cameras, or, or do they outsource it? Um, you know, just sitting at my desk right now. I've got a Canon camera, I've got uh, Logitech, I've got, you know, Amazon basic uh, shredder, you know, so the look around the room, I can build a watch list on things that I use every day. Okay. So as a consumer, um, you know, we, you know, as consumers, we buy things, we use things, uh, but to shift your mindset over to being an owner uh start to look at the things that you buy and purchase and you can build a watch list of the companies that are behind those products um, and as you start to follow those companies you start to take interest and then those companies may be companies you want to invest in right you think about it if i'm buying an, an iphone every year which you know they get us because for some reason uh the 10 start to slow down when the 11 come out I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure the twelve gonna slow down. The, the eleven gonna slow down when the twelve get ready to come out. So, so we buy iPhones every year. There's got to be something, you know, where where you know, it's something about an iPhone that makes people keep coming back. So, that may be a company I want to look into. Um, as you start looking at one company, you'll see other companies that compete with that company. Um, so then you'll you'll kind of start building your watches like that. Who's their biggest competitor? You know, it may be Samsung or Nokia or Blackberry, you know, so you build a watch, a court, watch list according to that. And, and, and whatever your industry is, whatever your field is, right? I was, um, I worked in aviation for the last eight years. And so my watch list includes uh, American Airlines, Southwest Airlines, Alaskan, mm -hmm. um, you know, JetBlue, uh, Boeing, uh, GE, because they make the engines, oh, yeah. right? Boeing, because they make the engines, right? And then once you get into GE, you start looking at Baker Hughes, because uh, they're an engineering firm that works with GE. So then you start looking at other engineering firms. And, and so I, you know, I challenge people to not only look at where you look at items and where you live, but also when you go to work, like what, what industry are you in? You know, is your company the best in the business? If so, you should be looking at your company's financials. You should be looking at their their kind of the, the background of your company and, and and what is your company doing, right? How valuable is your company? You know, Amazon has, you know, thousands and thousands of people that work for it. Um, if you work for Amazon, you should at least know what their stock price is, right? And More so, than four. And, 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 and I challenge people with, with any company they work for. If you work for a company and they're public, publicly traded, you should know what the stock price is. You should know when they announce earnings. You know, you should be on the calls to listen in when the CEO talks, when the CFO talks. So you build your watch list from home. You build your watch list from where you work. Um, and then, you know, like I said, things you consume. Um, 
and it'll, it'll start to, you know, you'll start to build a watch list up like that. Uh, and it'll grow over time. Uh, you know, and, and the third way that, uh, that I suggest building a watch list is, you know, involve yourself with other like-minded people, you know, get, start putting groups of people together, uh, you know, friends that you have that invest in the stock market. Uh, you know, they, they have a totally different list than you do. Right. So, uh, I have a group chat and a lot of times we throw out companies, you know, companies that I've never heard of or, or never thought to invest in. And so my watch list gets built off of other people doing the work, uh, which is important because, uh, you know, the, the, the stock market is, you know, it's filled with a vast amount of companies. And so, you know, as individuals, we'll, we'll never be able to uh, reach all of them or expand all industries and over the stock market. But with people uh, in a group or friends that you trade ideas with, uh, it's a really good way to build your watch list. So, yeah, and I see, I see that you know I'm a part of that group too. But I, I just don't contribute. I'm like a, I'm a watcher, so you know I don't want to throw out some bad information in, in the group chat. So I just kind of watch and see what people are talking about. And you know, there are some newbies and there's some people like yourself who've been doing it for a little bit longer. And they kind of have some information that they can share with everybody else. And that's what it's all about, you know, sharing the knowledge and sharing sharing information. So like you said, when you're in one industry, another person in another industry, and they they have a watch list or something that's you know totally different from something that you probably would ever even think about, and they kind of mm -hmm. get and get your attention on especially like those companies that you're working for and, and your your friends working for and you're seeing what they're doing and you're seeing how their stocks are trading and things like that okay so now you got this you you, you got the app you got the you got your watch list built up like mm -hmm. let's go through like the buying power okay you you've taken a little bit of your savings you've pinched off your savings you you got mm -hmm. bucks a hundred bucks or you know 20 bucks whatever you can kind of pinch off you got your watch list bills. Now take me through the buying or the buying of a stock. Like when you're ready to hit the trigger on it, what's your indicator to say, okay, this is a good buy at this price. Okay. So um, let's talk, we'll talk fundamentally. Um, so fundamentally, when I look at a company, I look at their financials, what did their cash flow look like? You know, what are you know, what are their operation? budgets look like, you know, what are they spending their money on? Are they still spending their money on research and development? Are they coming out with innovative products? Are they coming out with innovative processes? You know, are they buying other companies? Are they on the forefront of technology and moving in a space in which they lead? All right. So I look at a company in that way. And so from that point, from that standpoint, um, if all of those check off and I'm just like, yeah, I, I really like this company from a visual standpoint. And I'll look at kind of where the, where the, the stock price is. Um, and I tell people all the time, stock price doesn't give you the value of the company. Okay. It gives you the value of the demand of the stock, right? Because a lot of times you'll see companies price shoot through the roof. you be like, this company isn't worth that much. Right. Um, I saw, a uh, company today price go up like 400%. And I'm just like, this is not what this company is really worth. This is not the value of this company. It is the value of the demand of the stock at that time, right? So you have to be kind of careful when you are purchasing stock. And so what I do is I'll look at the stock price. I'll determine if the price is uh, a reflection of demand at that time and people are just driving it up or if it's a good valuation of where the company is and you can you can uh you know they they put out reports to tell you kind of uh you know how the company has done over the last quarters uh over the last three months they'll give you reports how much money they've made and so you can kind of uh judge if the price makes sense you know, if they've been losing money, but they're trading at, you know, $1,000 a share, you know, why is the price so high and they're still losing money? You know, are they putting a lot of money into research and therefore losing the money? Um, or are they not researching? They're just, you know, putting out product and they're not bringing any money in, right? So again, you'll look at it and say, well, this doesn't make sense. It's $1,000 price per share doesn't make sense with what's going on with the company. So if I do find a company 
where I say, okay, this price looks good. Uh, price may be distressed because of what's going on. I could take advantage of these low prices or the company may have been in trouble and they worked their way out of trouble. But, uh, you know, a lot of people went away from the company because they were in trouble. Uh, you know, and I say, okay, I think this company can turn itself around. It's what they were valued at before they went through kind of their process of getting back. Uh, right. Um, you know, I'll go in, uh, take funds, um, and, you know, put in a buy order. Uh, and, and it's simple, you know, buy order is basically hitting the buy button, right? You tell your brokerage, Robinhood, how many shares you want. Uh, so for example, let's say a company is trading at $10 a share. If I want to buy 10 shares, that's $100. I put my $100 in my account, uh, go on Robinhood and say, I want to buy 10 shares. And I hit buy. Um, and, and there are, you know, a couple of things that I'll tell people, uh, two main ways to buy, uh, two main ways to sell. Um, there are other ways, but they're more advanced level. Uh, one is just buying on market, right? So you hit the button say, give me 10 shares. I don't care how much they cost. Give me 10 shares. Right. And so your order goes out and then the cheapest 10 shares it can find, it goes and buys them and bring them back to you. So that may be a share, one share at $10, maybe one share at $10.20, maybe one share at $10.50, maybe one share at $11, right? Until you get your 10 shares, right? And, and you get your 10 shares and you get an average price. And so your average price for the 10 may be more than $10. Uh, so that's market, going to market and making a purchase. Uh, if you set a limit, right, you tell Robinhood how much you want to pay for each share. So I go in there and I say, Robinhood, give me 10 shares of this company and I only want to pay $10 per share. So I put that order in and now they will only purchase shares when the price hits $10. Mm -hmm. Now I may not get all my shares at once, uh, but they every time the price gets to 10, they'll purchase one. And so those are the main two ways to acquire shares in the market. I tell people, unless you have to get in a position uh, really fast or have to get out of a position really fast, you always want to set a limit and tell it how much you want to pay for it. It's really good practice. Uh, uh, it keeps you disciplined, right? You do your, your work and you say, all right, I'm willing to purchase this at $10. You know, be disciplined and not pay ten oh one for it. Be disciplined and not, you know, oh, it's only two cent more, pay ten oh two. Right, because as we gain more capital, you know, you if you go from buying ten shares to ten thousand shares, now paying that extra two cent over ten dollars, which is twenty cent, you're paying an extra ten cent over ten thousand, which is twenty dollars, right? If I'm doing that right, yeah, twenty dollars, right? So you you see how being undisciplined and saying. I want it right now can have you paying more than what you want to pay. So um, um, that's why I say, you know, it, and it's easy. Like I said, you, you put your money in your brokerage account, you go to the stock, hit buy, tell Robinhood how you want to buy, whether it's market or limit, and then purchase it. I'm good. You, I'm good. You brought that up because me, you know, not knowing anything about it. I just go in, I just hit, Hey, I want, I see this. Uh, I see this share. Oh, it's going for the low. Let me get. Let me get three of those. Let me get five. Of them. I'm at the menu. And I hit the buy button, and it just goes out and buy. And you're like, oh, now you got your order in. You bought it. Hey, uh, cool. I'm good. I'm, move, I'm moving on to the next. Not knowing, it's charging an extra five cent, ten cent. And like you said, when it's when it's small amounts, it's not really a, a huge deal. But when you start buying ten, twenty thousand, you start really putting that big money in there. That's yeah. a, that's an extra chunk of change that you wasn't even expecting. On the, right. back end, on the back end side. So that, that's a really good thing. That's a really good knowledge to have because me personally, I, I don't know about it. So I'm just hitting buy and I'm just a normal guy. And that's how probably normal people are going to do it when they first start off. They're just going to hit buy and they're just going to go in and just pay for it like that. So that's some good knowledge that you put out. So now we, we, we got the app. We got the information. We got our, we got our watch list. We, we bought our first one. Now we, we, we're patiently waiting. We're sitting on it. Mm -hmm. When do we get in there and when do we say, hey, look, it's time to get out of this position. We, we, we bought it at $10 and, you know, it, it was doing good the first day and a half. You know, the first week is doing good. You know, day 12, 
all right, I, I see the market is, you know, having a, it's, it's a panic day. It's Tuesday. It's panic day in, in the market. The market, yeah. the market is, you know, the cap down and it, it, it falls below $8. Am I, is it something that you are, I know an experienced trader would probably not panic, but for someone who's like an amateur like me and I go in, how do I get out of the position quickly? Do you get out of the position before you get in the position? Well, I'm saying, well, if I bought it and now it's 10 days, 10 days out and then all of a sudden it goes down to $8, should I keep it? Should I, should I, should I keep ride it out, ride it back up? Should I put more money in now that it's gone down? Like, give me some of those, 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 those things. I know you've been there before, so I know you kind of got an idea. Like, if the position mm -hmm. down, do I kind of lump, um, I'm kind of sitting back like, okay, I know it's going to go back up or do I, I panic and get, get out of it? So give me your thought process when that happens. So I know it sounded weird when I said it, but I actually said it right. So you get out of the position before you get in the position, right? Okay. So before you take a position in any company, in any position, you already want to know what your parameters are. Right? You want to know if this drops below this amount, whether I'm going to sell it, whether I'm going to buy more, or I'm going to let it stay, all right? So you, you, you got to know before you go into a position. So I always have those numbers in my head, right? If I buy something at $10, and this is just for an example, I know if, well, first, so let's just say I want 10 of something at $10. I'm willing to spend $100. And I can purchase it for 10. Um, uh, you know, I would approach it like this. Uh, I'd purchase five. All right. If I'm if I'm unsure of what the market is doing, I purchase five, and then from there, I say, okay, um, I don't I don't really know if it's gonna go up or down, but I purchase my five. I'll kind of wait. Uh, if it goes down, I'm prepared to buy more. All right. So let's just say it goes down to eight, and eight is my buy more signal. Uh, I buy more. All right. So where that where I only got five, it goes down to eight. I got fifty dollars left. Um, you know, I can get, what, six, All right? So now as opposed to having 10, I can get 11, right? So that's that's my buy. If it starts to go up, um, you know, if I'm disciplined, I'll wait. I'll say, you know what? I think it'll come back down to 10, uh, I'll wait. Now I say, if it goes above, let's just say it goes above 12, I'm gonna go ahead and use the rest of my capital to get the rest of them because I know at 12 it's gonna keep going or I've done you know my my studies. I know if it breaks 12, it's pretty pretty much solid, it's gonna keep going. I'll use the rest of my capital to buy. Now I may not be able to buy the 10 like I wanted, uh, but I'm going to increase my position um, uh, with with the remaining $50 that I have. Now again, on the flip side. Let's just say it drops down to eight. That's my buy range. Say it drops down to six again. Six may be my sale, right? If it drops down to six, I lose, what is six? 40% of my uh, my position, I'm automatically out. No questions asked. I don't sit here and tell myself, oh, it's going to go back up, right? I get out, take my loss, and then I rethink my position again, right? I may even get back in at at the $6 mark, um, but I have to reevaluate where I am. And so a lot of times we, we get into, we get into this battle with ourselves and we say, oh, oh, it's gonna go back up, it's gonna go back up. Oh, oh you know, it's just, it's just dropping, uh, it'll go back up. Uh, but we forget or we don't have in place our, um, our limits. All right, so before you enter a trade, you have to be ready to sell it. And that's on the downside or the upside. So, and this is just an example again, if it, if it starts at 10, let's just say I bought 10 at $10. If it drops down to eight, maybe I have some more capital and say, you know what, I'll buy some more. Um, if it drops down to six, I say, you know what, that was a bad decision, I'm out, All right? And so then I say, okay, with the capital that I have left, let me rethink my plan. Uh, let me look at six, what does six really look like? If six looks like an even better number than it was at 10, I may get back in at six and see if I can go back up with it. Uh, and, and, I, and again, on the upside as well, if it's going up, let's just say it's at 10, it goes up to 12, uh, you know, 
I may allow it to go up. I may, you know, let it move uh, if I see momentum going in that direction. Uh, but when I get in at 10, I already know what I want to get out of. And this goes back to the example we talked about earlier uh, with a company that was distressed because of COVID. I know in my head that if it gets back to the level it was pre-COVID, I am taking a percentage of my position off the top. Right? So I will, I will, you know, exchange some of my shares for uh, some capital, and I'm, you know, may leave a few in there to kind of see if it'll it'll uh, sustain momentum and and go back to levels prior to pre-COVID. Right? So you got to kind of kind of watch it. Um, I have, you know, I kind of set my you know, my parameters uh, depends on what I'm trading. Um, so, forty percent is is you know if I'm if I'm doing options, all right, forty percent is kind of like my limit on both ends. Forty uh, percent on the downside is kind of like all right, I'm out, uh, and then forty percent on the on the upside is I'm out. All right, I'll take my profit and leave. So that's 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 worked out really well for me. As far as the stocks, again. Uh, you know, I bought, I want to say, uh, for example, I bought uh, PG&E, right? Uh, that's, that's one of the companies that's been kind of taking a downturn for a while, right? Uh, they went through the, the fires here in California. Uh, they, they went through lawsuits, uh, bankruptcy, and then COVID on top of that. And so the price is really, really low. Now it is a risk, uh, which in which you you know you have risk in 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 the market, but I'm looking at it and the price is really really low for the type of company that it is, a company that's been around forever. Um, you know they they pretty much monopoly monopolize the uh, energy sector in California and I think in parts of Arizona and Nevada, and so uh, you know I started buying shares of PG&E. And so the price started to go up today. Uh, but in my head, I'm like, okay, uh, there is a risk, right? The price could go down. Um, and, you know, I've said before, if I'm, I give it 20% on the downside, if I'm, you know, 20% on the downside, I'm out. Uh, but that doesn't mean I don't invest back in them, right? That just means my strategy for how I'm playing that 20% 20, 20 would put me outside of my, uh, my strategic approach for where I originally purchased it. So if it drops 20%, I then have to be disciplined enough to say, I got to get out and reevaluate my position because the company, the stock price looks totally different than it did when I initially invested in it. So uh, that's kind of how I do, that's that's one example of a company and, and how, I, how I do it. Um, but I tell people you don't, you don't make money in the stock market until you sell your share, right? Uh, a lot of times we buy uh, something and, it, and the price shoots up and we want to leave it in there and, and hold it in there, which is good um, if that con company continues to do better. But just know that we're exchanging uh, capital for shares so that at some point we can exchange the shares for capital you know, and in hopes that we're, we're bringing in much more capital. So uh, you have to be ready, you know, at your price point to sell your shares um, and not expect the price to continue to go up forever. Right. Um, so yeah. that's, that's, that's kind of my take on it. And, what, and what, how you explain it kind of makes, give me, uh, in my analogy, how I think about it is like when I go to the casino, you know, down the, you know, down the silt, we always at the casino. Mm -hmm. Three, five hundred dollars with me to the to the casino. I'm like, all right, look, this is all I'm taking with me. I'm all in. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But if I get down to this, I might just slide on out of there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what I'm saying? If I'm up a little bit, I'm gonna take that little cash out a little bit, put a little yeah. bit, and I'm gonna kind of come keep playing. But like, if I get down to that, I go from five hundred to three hundred. I'm like, all right, cause I got a couple hundred more. If I get down to about two hundred. I'm like, all right, look, I might go ahead and cash it in. So you mm -hmm. cash out, and then you might move on. You might want to go play, you know, the slots or something else, or you play blackjack or whatever the case may be. But you start off, you know, what I'm saying, and at that crap table trying to get up. 
So I kind of w related to what you were saying, like you get me in and get out your strategy. You already got a strategy in mind. Like, okay, if I lose this amount of amount of money, then I'm going to cash out. But if I win this, I'm going to take some of that profit, tuck it away, keep playing, you know, and reinvest and kind of keep going, keep going in on them. So I know we, we went through, you know, we got the stock list, we got the apps, we got the information, we got the, the buying power, we got the stocks. Like what sectors are you, you know, saying some of those hot sectors right now. I know with, with the virus, the COVID that's out there, I know, like I said, we talked about it earlier with a lot of these companies trying to get patents. And I know some of these universities are already, you know, putting these, trying to get patents on everything before the, the virus, the, the vaccine, the, vac the vaccination is actually put out into the public. Because we know once somebody finds out the cure, it's going to be a mad dash to try to get it out to everybody. And that company is going to, you know, propel because you got, you know, you got, Genentech out here, you got um, a couple of others, but I forget the name off the top of my head, a couple of biotech companies. So is the biotech sector where it's at? Because I know the, the airline sector, they're probably taking a massive hit because they've definitely, you know, uh, taken a, nobody's traveling. You know, I say nobody's traveling, but the travel is down. Nobody's actually all at those airports. So which right. sectors are you, you know, kind of feel that you're moving around in that's kind of good that people should maybe tap into or look into? Um, I think... I, uh, so on the positive side, uh, companies that I think that are doing well, technology companies. Uh, so what's going on right now is a lot of people are working from home more than we're used to. And so there's a big urgency, urgency to get people up and running at home, right? And so you look at companies that specialize in uh, video conferencing, teleconferencing, uh, you look at Zoom, you look at Microsoft, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if Apple came out with their own uh, kind of video conferencing that's, that's specific to the iPhone or the iPad or, or, or uh, Apple. So you look at companies that are putting people in a better position to work from home. Uh, you, yeah, you got your Microsoft, you got your, your Apple, you got Zoom. Um, you know, just looking around, you, you start to think about security companies, uh, companies that specialize in internet security. Um, I, I think one that we use is uh, Palo Alto Network. Right? They're, they're really big in 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 security, and so I, that's that's what I've been looking at as far as on the upside. Looking at a lot of these tech companies, companies that have uh, downsized, but still been able to keep up with production all right so you look at look at a, take a company like facebook right um facebook campus was massive right you think about all the people that facebook campus had to feed every day the electricity they were using something as simple as the pencils and pens they were buying on a daily basis to have people to write to operate people needed desk and people were bringing you know they needed whatever Right, so now that goes from 100 to what of whatever it was to basically zero. Right, people don't even you know people aren't on the campus. If they are, there there's spots here and there. So then, so a lot of that overhead that they were having to pay or cover, Facebook doesn't have to do that anymore. Right, and they have their people set up to work from home, so they're saving money on that side. Um, you know, they may have went through massive layoffs. Although, although I think Facebook, you know. They, I've seen quite a bit of uh, positions open at Facebook, um, but uh, you know they're in a position to continue to grow because they've cut down on a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of operation costs, costs that the things that 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 they needed for people to produce. Now they don't have to, uh, you know, pay for those things. So uh, again. I like tech companies because they they were at the forefront of being in a position to where people could work from home, but they can go right, they can continue to work. Uh, and tech companies will be providing us with the equipment, right? So we talked about this earlier. Apple, you got an iPhone, right? What are you using? Microsoft, Microsoft uh, Teams. Uh, we're on Zoom right now, right? So all of these companies are publicly traded companies. Um, and they're moving us towards where we are now right they're moving us into this what i think will be the norm 
or the semi-norm even after mm -hmm. COVID-19. Uh, so tech companies, um, I, I am on the lookout for healthcare companies, uh, companies that produce, you know, pharmaceuticals and, and, and drugs. Um, Pfizer is a big one. Uh, you have some of your off, um, uh, kind of your off uh, biofarms or pharmaceutical companies that aren't as well known. Uh, uh, Inovio, they've been kind of in the news a lot with uh, vaccine where they've received funding from uh, Bill Gates Foundation and the federal government to push research on getting the vaccine out and, and, a, and a few more other companies. So I've been kind of looking at the uh, uh, healthcare and, and pharmaceutical uh, as well, uh, but also the healthcare on the tech side as well. So you got a few companies that specialize in tech, but on the healthcare side, right? Because we're moving towards an area where, uh, you know, people are still gonna get sick, people are still gonna need doctors, but how, do, how does that look inside of an inside the office building now? How does that, you know, how can doctors uh, diagnose you, diagnose you from a, a video conference or, you know, is, is, are those conferences, conference lines secure to where my information that I share with my doctor is secure, right? Um, you know, um, video and, and, and picture phones might not be just for uh, sending nudes anymore. You know what I'm saying? We might be, we might be sending them to our doctors uh, to, to look and be like, doc, what's wrong, right? So we need security in place so that people aren't, you know, they aren't stealing your pictures while you're sending information to your doctor. So again, technology, internet security, medical, um, because I think medical is going to be revamped in the way that we handle it. Um, so those are a few. Um, to the downside, uh, retail, uh, minus Amazon, right? Every All retail outside of Amazon. Um, let's see, what else? Airlines, you know, I, like I said, I've worked in that industry and I've seen cuts like you wouldn't believe. Um, you know, I was working at one of the most trafficked airports in the US and traffic went from 60 million to almost a hundred, couple hundred thousand. I know, you know? I, like I was telling you earlier, I just, I just went through that. So I just flew back and I came, well, even when I was going, I, and I've traveled through SFO, you know, for years, and you, no matter what time you get there, the airport's always busy because you always say, oh, I'm gonna go to the airport. And when you get there, you get there early in the morning, you're like, all right, nobody's gonna be there. It's too early in the morning. You get there and it's crazy busy in the morning. You get there in the middle of the day, it's crazy. You get there at night, it's crazy. And then on our flight back when we got here, we got back probably like four in the evening and it was like literally nobody in the airport. So, you know, everybody's kind of been at home and the travel's been cut down. And, and just going back to what you said earlier about the doctors, you know, my wife working in the hair care field, you know, we were sending pictures. They're already on that because like their doctor, they're, they're working from home now because, you know, some of those doctors that see the, like the radiologists and, you know, cardiologists, all these people are a little bit older. They've probably been in the industry, been working in the industry for long, longer periods of time. And so they don't even want to come to the hospital. They're like, look, I'm not coming into the hospital. You know, I'm not trying, you know, basically they don't want to get sick because they're a little bit older and a little bit, you know, in that age range where the virus really attacked that age range, you know, mm -hmm. you see, and attacked that age range. So they're like, look, I'm not coming in. You got to send it to me at my house. And if they're not equipped at home to do it at home, so they have to, you know, do it on these old, probably old Lenovo laptops or whatever laptops mm -hmm. they're doing. So, and that's causing major lag time because you go send, send something that's been made in the last two years, and then you got to turn around and send it to a, a large file to somebody that's at home that really doesn't even know how to use a computer. And you're yeah. trying to, you know, show something that's very important for somebody's health. And so we have to kind of catch up. I think technology is, and this is, you know, with every, with every down, there's always going to be something good and positive come from it. And I think there's going to be something positive because companies now know that, look, we don't have to be in those offices every day. We don't have to be coming to those in, in droves and traffic, sitting on the park trying to get to the office. We can work from home. So you can't use that, use that to hold us hostage to the office lifestyle and, and uh, anymore so now we can push the we can push the technology forward like you know because everybody's on the vpn everybody's working from home mm -hmm. like that so i totally get what you're saying and what the industry is like what 
those industry who have been, been eating off us for years and years and years, they're bloated. Like those airlines, they've been eating off us with those bag fees, maintenance fees. Man, air, airlines are, airlines have been eating, bro. Like, like I don't understand how they need bailouts when they, they, they're constantly overcharging us for flights, you know, mm-hmm. and overbooking, you know, double selling seats. And, and I just don't get how when something goes bad, they immediately jump in. Like, let's say the airlines, let's say the airlines, we got to say the airlines. Like, yeah, I, you know, you think you look at some of these airlines and how much money they bring in, yes. like have money yes. for situations like this, but you know, they apply for these loans and, and they get them. And for them, it's like, you know, we'd rather apply for these loans and not, and not have to go into our savings. Uh, and we'll pay back the loan over what, 20 years uh, or, or whatever. So uh, yeah, it, you know, there is a bit of, you know, these uh, seeing these companies kind of not go under, but kind of struggle. Uh, and they can really, you know, continue to pay and, 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 and tap into their reserves to get through this time. But uh, they're using government funds, which could be, you know, used for something else, really kind of sits kind of uh, on the bad side with me uh, when I look at certain companies. Uh, I, know so, I-, and I think airlines is one of them, uh, simply for the fact that I know how much money airlines bring in and and how much money they have when you talk about reserves and that they put to the side for situations like this to uh, sustain uh, unemployment levels and sustain operations uh, you know when they come out of it and and so it's 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 kind of mind blowing to see them preparing to furlough these massive amounts of people or lay off these massive, massive amounts of people. Even after receiving uh, bailout money and not having to spend their reserves. So. Yeah, I told you, know, I told you, I talked about it before on the podcast. It's like, you know, these, these airlines, they've been, like I said, they've been making all this money for years and years and years. And as soon as something happened, they're the first in line to try to get money. And that made me realize, like, you know, I know we never really thought about it, but, you know, they always try to say, you don't want to live check to check. But we just realized that the country itself been living from month to month. We went, we went basically hit the, we hit the virus, hit us, you know, early, early March. And, you know, first of May, they like, look, we got it. We need money. Like, <laughs> yeah, we, if you don't give us this money, we are gonna have to shut everything down, travel, yeah. and that affect like companies like like how do you feel about companies like like these travel well these bed and breakfasts like Airbnb? That was like one of the one of the biggest companies probably looked on the verge of going hitting the IPO. And I know they had hit a couple of raises, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden you know this happens and it's like oh, like now we got to switch. Like you got Airbnb, you got Uber and Lyft, and all these companies that are really relying on people traveling and moving, and then all of a sudden they you know, you hit this and nobody's moving around. And now they, you're seeing these big companies having to pivot and try to, you know, go. Because I just saw that, you know, Uber bought, into, bought uh, I think, Postmates. Postmates. Bought Postmates. And so that diversified their portfolio. So they no longer just totally relying on ride share and, and mm-hmm. get into the eating industry. And you know, a lot of these companies trying to pivot and trying to find ways. And like I said, this virus is basically, it's going to show, it's, it's going to kill off the wheat. You know, you're going to kill off the week because these companies who have been struggling for a long period of time, mm-hmm. they're hanging on by the thread, the virus shut that down and killed them off. And it just, the stronger company is going to survive and it's going to be new companies that come from this and they're going to be the next, you know, you know, Uber or the next Facebook or, so, or something bigger or something better or something. Because like every, every few decades, something comes along to knock off something else. Like we knew at one point in time, Sears was the number one company probably in the world. And then all of a sudden it goes on and then you have Amazon, the springboard over, over Walmart, you know, you have Walmart come along, kill out Kmart. And then now you have Amazon and trying to, Amazon is reshaping how we think about, you know, logistics. Like, like, I, like I'm not mad at him for being, you know, Jeff Bezos for being a, a tree, you know, whatever he is now, uh, because he, he, he took a loss for 10 years, just selling books. You go from selling books to, you know, you have the number one logistic company in the world. So you have to, you got you to applaud that, but it's just how he go about 
you know, what is he doing with their funds once you kind of got all that money? What are you doing with it? Are you investing it back into the people? Like, what are you doing with those funds? That's what I, that's what my thing come in. Like, are you, are you putting back into these communities that you're taking from daily? Are you paying your employees who are actually working in these factories, especially during the COVID? Cause you know, they haven't shut down. Cause basically if you think about now, if Walmart or Amazon shut down, the world will kind of come to a real halt because you can do anything to your house because they, you know, they got their tentacles and everything. They're into the, the, the food market. They're into the Whole Foods. They're the Amazon Fresh. You know, they got all these, they're into all these different markets. And we don't really realize it until it stops coming to you. Then you have to kind of go back out there. But mm-hmm. you're on a tangent. So I know we went through, you know, you got your app. You got your, you got your watch list. You, you, you purchased something. Um, you've been able to get out of it. You made a profit or you, you got out. You, you had a loss. You kind of went back in and you do those type of things. Now, Let's, I know we talked about it in earlier. Let's let's move over to this. I know we got a little time here. We try to get it in real quick. Like, right. uh, how do you, how do you go about you know transitioning from okay, I've been I, I'm I'm no longer I'm still an amateur, but I'm kind of a I'm a I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm up a level above amateur now. Now I want to do some trading. You know, I want I want to do some some option trading. Like mm-hmm. how do that transition to the option trading, and would you rather do option trading versus just regular? buy and sell how, how does that how do you think about that when it comes down to um, my- i'll say about 80 percent of what i do well what i've been doing has been options versus just buying to stop uh and options work similar to uh it's a good example um uh, like let's say you want to um purchase put something on i guess you could say put something on railway right uh, so, so options is basically like putting something on layaway. Uh, so let's say I go into a store and I see a TV that I want to purchase, right? A TV is a thousand dollars. Now, uh, prices don't move this fast in the real world, but let's just say they say, all right, the TV is a thousand dollars, but every day the price is going to change on it. So in my head, I said, okay, I don't have the thousand dollars to pay for the TV right now, but, uh, you know, let's sign a contract and I'll give you some money that I can come back in a month and I can purchase the TV for for $1,000. And the person says, okay, uh, give us $100 today. And then in a month, you can come back and purchase the TV for $1,000. So that's, I just bought an option contract, right? So now I just, I just signed a contract. I paid them $100. They gave me the contract and I can walk back in the store anytime between now and a month from now and purchase that TV for a thousand dollars. Now let's just say the TV, uh, the the price of the TV goes up to 2000, right? Um, Whoever makes the TV, the factory catches on fire and all the TVs caught on fire except for this one TV. So the price of it is a $2,000 and it's two weeks later. I can walk in that store and give them a thousand dollars and walk away with that two thousand dollar TV. Right? That's that's options, right? Because I put down a premium early to purchase that TV by a certain amount of time, I can walk in that store at any time and purchase that TV for that price. So the price of the TV can go up to ten thousand. It can go up to twenty thousand. I walk in that store before that thirty days is over. It I can purchase that TV for a thousand dollars. Right. So the way you win with the options, right? I, I, I gave them a hundred dollars. I walk in, um, let's just call it a month later. Let's say the TV's uh, tr- priced at 2000. I purchased the TV for a thousand. I sell it on the street for 2000. I just pocketed an extra thousand dollars, right? By putting a hundred dollars down, I just made an extra thousand dollars. Now let's just say, because I own a contract, it's a piece of paper, it's a contract, it is transferable. Uh, just like, you know, uh, some contracts are, they're, they're transferable. Like if I have a contract with somebody and I no longer want the contract, I could transfer the contract. You know, let's just say I have a family member I want to transfer it to or a friend I want to transfer it to, just write it over. Now they have the contract with the person. So let's just say I paid $100 because that's how much the contract was to purchase it for $1,000 in 30 days. So I come in the store the next day and the TV's worth $2,000, right? So let's just say I go back to the person, I'm like, so I want to purchase this TV. 
uh, for a thousand dollars within 30 days you know how much do i have to put down it's not going to be a hundred dollars anymore right they're going to say all right the tvs are worth at least a thousand dollars more so we're going to add a thousand dollars on to whatever we we offer you and then we might add a little bit more because you got from now until the end of the month so they may say all right the, the price of it is two thousand but to purchase it for a thousand is is going to call you got to put down at least 1500 right because the price could go up to 3000 right they don't know i don't know so they say give us 1500 and in 30 days we'll let you purchase this for a thousand right so i give them 1500 right and then 30 days from now if the price goes up to 3000 i can still purchase it for a thousand now i, I purchase it for a thousand out of pocket totally i'm out $2,500 because I gave them $1,500 and I purchased it for $1,000, but I got a $3,000 TV. Now, with that example, the first person walked in on the first day, the TV was $1,000. He paid him $100 to get the TV for $1,000 by the end of the month. The second person walked in on the second day, the TV was $2,000. He paid them $1,500 to be able to purchase the TV for $1,000 by the end of the month. Now, what could have happened was the person that walked in on the first day, which is me, um, saw the TV was $1,000. I said, hey, hold that TV. I'm going to give you $100 to the end of the month. Then I'll give you $1,000 for that TV. If I walked in the second day, the same time the other guy was walking in. He saw that TV. and He like, man, I want that TV. But I don't got the money. But I want to you know, I want to lock in the price. I say, you know what? I got a contract here. You know, they're they're charging fifteen hundred to be able to purchase it for a thousand. You can buy my contract, right? And so now, the day before, I gave them a hundred. This person wants the same price as I do, but the current price is higher. So he's gonna pay more for the contract. So I give him my contract, but he gives me fifteen hundred. Mm, so that's how you get your bread. That's how you get your bread up in options. That's how most people do options. Uh, that's you know that's taking a little bit of money and controlling a large amount of the, the shares right uh, when you take an option contract you actually control a hundred shares worth of the company so whatever that thousand dollars equal to a uh, hundred shares uh, so that's ten dollars a share so let's just say there's a hundred shares worth there's ten dollar there's a hundred ten dollar shares in that TV. And so I buy one contract, that means I got a hundred shares of that TV, which is ten dollars a piece, so it's a thousand dollars. so again, and I know it's it's a lot to follow uh because options take some time to to understand them, but once you understand them, it's really simple. Uh so again. You could make a down payment, hold it for um, a month, hoping that the price goes past what you are asking them to hold it for, buy it and then resell it for more. That's how you profit. You can come in, give them a hundred dollars to hold it for a thousand. If it goes up the next day and now people are well, willing to pay more for that hundred dollar contract you pay, you can sell that hundred dollar contract to somebody else, transfer it to somebody else, they give you that money, all right? So I paid a hundred, somebody transferred me, you know, let's just say the price went up and they want to pay a thousand. Now that thousand dollar contract is worth 200. I say, hey, I got a contract here, you can purchase it. I give them the contract, they give me $200. Now I just made a net, uh, you know, I just made $200 off my initial $100 investment. Um, so that's the second way you can make uh, money off of options. And then, so I think that's, yeah, purchase, you know, purchase contracts, sell it for later, um, purchase the contract, sell the contract for a higher price. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so those are the two ways you can make money off options. Um, you know, the, I guess the third kind of out on an option is not making money, but if you were to buy a contract with somebody, uh, and then the price doesn't get to 
the agreed upon price. So let's just say I gave you a hundred dollars to purchase it for a thousand. And then in 30 days, the TV is only worth 800. I'm not going to give you a thousand for the TV. I'm just going to let the, the, the contract expire worthless. And then I'm going to come back and buy the TV for 800. All right. So those are kind of your three ways. Those are three ways that options uh, kind of pan out. Uh, but you can see, you know, taking a hundred dollars, um, the price goes up quickly. That same contract you purchased for a hundred dollars now is going for even more. You can sell that, sell or transfer that contract to somebody else and put that difference in your pocket. That's how the majority of people trade contracts um, in, so, in options, trade so options. Would you say it's more beneficial for a beginner to start with options because it's a little bit more, you know, has a little bit more knowledge? but at the same time, you're probably making more on a buy sale or just buying regular individual shares one at a time and trying to, you know, learn that way, then flipping over to the options. Um, I would say, you know, starting out just to, to learn, uh, to get your feet wet, buy, to, to buy some shares, right? Buy, purchase some shares, sell some shares, just to see how that whole process works because options takes a different skill level. Uh, in addition to what you have, uh, your knowledge in purchasing and, and selling shares, options is, you know, you have to, you have to look at a little bit more than just, you know, all right, I like the company. Um, you have to kind of take into consideration how much the price is going to move between a certain time frame, um, and, you know, where are my entry and exit points? You really have to be kind of, uh, you know, you have to be active when you're trading options, uh, especially in the short term. So I would suggest anybody getting started, uh, you know, look into buying and selling the shares uh, versus options, but definitely learn options quick, right? Because not only do options give you an opportunity to invest a small amount of capital and control a large amount of a position, it also opens your eyes up to what's going on on the back end uh, with, with companies. And so for example, you'll see, sometimes you'll see the share price going down, but the contract price for a specific uh, strike price in an option is going up, right? And, 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 it, and it kind of, it's weird. Like why is the price going up, but the stock price is going down? So that just, opens your eyes up to make there may be something else going on behind the scenes right and that's that's a whole nother topic you could you could spend on talking about the psychology and the 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 war that goes on behind the scenes of a stock price that people with large amounts of money uh play all right so uh but again once you equip yourself with the knowledge of options and have the ability to trade options, uh, looking at options and the stock price opens you up to a whole different kind of world and, and knowledge. So I would suggest, you know, learning it um, as quickly as possible, because again, uh, you can purchase, uh, you know, the ability to control a hundred shares of a company that you, for a small amount that you may not be able to own a hundred shares of it. But as the share price goes up, the, the contract price goes up and you could sell those contracts as well. So Okay, cool. I know, uh, I know we got to wrap it up here soon. So I'll just, I know we've been giving some, some great gems that you've been talking about, about the stock market. I know it's yeah. deep and it's, 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 it's and forever. It's, it's, it's a lot, man. And I, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm like, I can, because I've done it so long, I could, I, mean, I could go on and on and on and on and talk about it and I get excited about it. And there's so many corners that I can hit when I talk about it, but it is a lot. And I try to break it down to people as slowly as possible. Uh, so, but I do recommend that, you know, people watching this or, or listening to this, hit the rewind button, you know, um, and you can, you know, listen to it over and over again, right? Because I don't think we do enough of just absorbing the information. So absolutely. And like I said, um, I will try to wrap it up in a few seconds, but I just want, I definitely want to get this in because I know I see a lot of this come across my timeline, you know, 
quickly, what is your thought? What is your, what is your, how do you feel about people when they're promoting Forex or is it, is it Forex? It's Forex, right? Forex. Um, for people promoting it and saying they make so much money on it. Can you give a quick description of what it is? And do you feel like it's a scam when people are actually talking about it and pushing it, trying to join their team and things like that? Cause I know if it's coming across my timeline, it's coming across other people's timeline. And if you don't know about it, you'll jump in it and spend your money and you'll kind of get caught on the hook not knowing what's going on. Okay, so uh, foreign exchange is basically your, your trading currency against currency, which is all legal. It's all legit. Um, you know, you have people that specialize in doing it. And so it's another way of making, you know, making money, right? above the end I'm, I'm starting to my profits are starting to increase so then i can sell it all right it's the exact same thing so it's it's all legit it's just a different avenue of investing and trading now with the forex groups if if they're providing knowledge and you're paying for the knowledge and it's something that you can take away and walk away with and produce it on your own uh i'm all for it if someone says hey you know the only way you can make money is bring more people in. Uh, you know, we're we're going. You know, you pay this price and you get our um, you get our uh, alerts. Like we're not. You know, they don't teach you how to do it, but they're just giving you alerts, right? Um, I'm not. I'm not a big supporter of that uh, because again, it doesn't teach you. Uh, this you know, this stock market, this this investing thing is. It, it allows you to be. A ton, you know, to, to work, you know, by yourself, right? You can, you can be anywhere doing it, but if you have to connect yourself to someone and wait on them to give you something in order to make money, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big supporter of that. I'm not a big supporter of paying into a, something that doesn't teach me the tools that I need to then walk away and do it on my own. All right. So, uh, I'll just leave it at that. Um, you know, I haven't come across a forex group that I thought was legit yet. So, uh, and I've come across quite a few. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Coming across my timeline, I know it's going across everybody's timeline because yeah. everybody's at home, everybody's hitting like, and so the algorithm is probably pushing it to more people because these people are joining groups and spending forty, fifty dollars, and it might not seem like a lot, but if you're getting forty, fifty dollars from ten to fifteen, twenty different people, you yourself at the top of the Ponzi scam, you're making all the money and you're mm -hmm. not the information, and people mm -hmm. like they get in, they excited, and then all of a sudden, two weeks later, they're like, man, what's going on? I really don't know what I'm doing. So. Yeah just wrap up everything that we talked about you know we, we got you with your brokerage we got you with your apps we got you with your watch list how to look around your home get you some watch list together uh, more or less going about you know hitting that button going to buy buying at the right number that you want to buy it, not just hitting buy like me and just buying and just letting the shares come to you however they come to you buying at a certain price that you want to get in getting out at a certain price um, not necessarily losing the money, but you know what I'm saying? If you know that you're losing, but you have a have a, a, a strategy in your head that if something goes to a certain number, I know I need to get out. But if something goes up to a certain number, I need to get out as well. So just all about, you know, just listening to you, just all about having a strategy in place mm -hmm. before you even get into something. Not necessarily just seeing something come across your, your watch list and you see it, you buy it, and you kind of get into it and you don't really understand what you just bought. And then having to go through that struggle of trying to get out of it and then, and losing money on the back end side. Also wrapping it up with that with that um, you know, trading options and that could be a whole. We might have to do a part two to come back and just talk about doing. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be now. Even do a challenge like I was even thinking about doing like a challenge to say, what's the pair of what's I don't know what's the price of pair of jewelry like two hundred dollars or something two twenty five. Take that two twenty five over the next two or three weeks and just see how you know. Instead of buying, you know, somebody's like, hey, instead of waiting in line and buying a pair of Jordans, let's take that money and let's spread it across Nike, you know, Adidas or some other, you know, mm -hmm. apparel company that could possibly make you more money than just, you know, buying those shoes, wearing them. And then all of a sudden you're trying to flip them on StockX or whatever try to, app you're trying to flip them on and you're losing money, you know, versus putting it in the stock market and teaching yourself and you being able to fish for a lot longer. So, right, right, right. 
So what we'll do is, um, I know you got, you know, if you're working on anything, you know, here's an opportunity for you to kind of push up. If you got any classes or anything that you got going on, you know, please let the people know about it. And you, you know, give me your, 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 time, your handles and things. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, you know, I do every Sunday. I do a stock market Sunday. Uh, right now we're doing it on Instagram, but we're going to move it to YouTube. But you can follow me on Instagram at the Black Nerd. That's T H E B L K N R D. Um, you know, and then we have a group uh, chat. Uh, we, you, you mentioned it earlier. We have a group chat. It's about, we got about 220 people, 230 people in it. Uh, again, we got people of all different uh, experience levels. And so, um, you know, there's always somebody in there to help you to answer your questions. Uh, send me a, uh, you know, you can send me a direct message through Instagram. I'll send you the link to the group chat. Uh, I'm in the process of um, changing it. Uh, I think it'll be very beneficial for the group. Um, so, but still send me that, uh, you know, direct message. I'll give you the link for the group chat. Um, like I said, we're, you know, again, we're every Sunday we're on, we're on Instagram. So look out for us. Um, you know, we're going to start back uh, doing classes. And it's funny you mentioned, um, you know, I'm going to put together a, uh, a challenge, um, kind of a challenge pilot uh, to see how it goes with, with a group of people. And then I may push it out to more people, but it'll be, it'll be coursework um, to, you know, kind of handhold people and get them over the fear of investing and actually make some, some very, some, some lucrative, you know, some, some, I won't say lucrative because that's the plan. Uh, everything isn't lucrative, but to make some good sound investments. Um, and so uh, that, that'll be coming out, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you posted on that. And, you know, we'll definitely have to get back on here and do a part two, whether we talk about options or we talk about playing the downside to the market, which is very beneficial in knowing uh, because again, it opens up another kind of thought process behind investing, uh, playing the downside. And it's probably something we all should know uh, because of what we're in, you know, because of the situation we're in. But yeah, we'll definitely have to jump back on here and do another one. Definitely, because I definitely want to kind of, you know, we didn't get a chance because we got to go over. I don't want to go over too much time. We got, you know, things to do tomorrow. So I definitely want to talk about like SAPs, SAP 500s and all that good stuff. So that's an opportunity for us to kind of jump back in here. Well, I'll get that link from you and put it in the show notes and we'll, you know, make sure everybody get an opportunity. If they want to join, please join. You know, I, I want to, you know, I bring him on because he's like, like I said, he's been, you know, teaching me and showing me and introducing me to new things. So like you got to have, you know, your five, you guys are going to be the average of your five best friends. So if your five best friends are actually doing wealthy and doing great and you're going to be the sixth person but if you're hanging around five people or doing just nothing hanging on the tree you're going to be the sixth person so you have to control your circle and make sure your circle have you know some people with some knowledge and some some uh, some wealth to kind of push you forward to make you want to do forward and inspire to do better with your life so uh, with that i go ahead and conclude and wrap it up i appreciate you guys checking us out you know once again this is your boy frank nitty this is dope vision experience virtual tour come back and check us out in the future man and, and make sure you check out those show notes and, and, and link up with J-Hub on Instagram. So if you have any questions, you can hit me or hit him. Appreciate you guys. Until next time, holla at your boy. This is Frank Nitty. I'm out.